When I was a kid, there was one aspect of the Christmas story that I found disturbing. We had a Bible story book with an illustration depicting Roman soldiers with very large swords coming to Bethlehem to kill all the baby boys there. Though I, I don't know that I was really traumatized, it was probably not something that a five-year-old should think a whole lot about. And one of the puzzling things about the Gospels is, is that after the birth narratives in Matthew and Luke, the, the Christmas story, we are told nothing about Jesus' life until he begins his public ministry at about age 30. Nothing except... Luke's account of Jesus' visit to the temple in Jerusalem when he's 12 years old, and Matthew's account of Joseph and Mary taking Jesus to Egypt and living in exile there. Now, maybe some of you are thinking, what? Jesus lived in Egypt? That's okay, because it's not a passage we talk about very often, at least here, uh, I do not remember preaching a sermon or leading, even leading a Bible study on this text in almost 40 years as a pastor. I, I think I must have, but I don't remember it. So it's about time. Matthew 2, 13 through 23. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. That's our text. Matthew 2, 13 through 23. And we will look at these verses seeking to understand what this portion of Scripture says. And then we'll think about what these words mean for our lives today. So let's just pause and pray that the Lord would both encourage and challenge us through his word this morning. Well, Father, we thank you again for the Bible, the Word of God, and the truth we find, again, in every sentence. And we pray today that um, this story, this true story, would impact our lives, maybe in ways I can't even imagine, but that they would impact our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the background of this passage is the wise men. You remember this? They came to worship the one who was born king of the Jews. And when King Herod, the, the current ruler, ruler of the region, hears this, he summons the wise men. This is chapter 2, verse 8. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Herod is not telling the truth. That's not what he intends to do. His real intention is not to honor the new king, but to harm him. And thus, verse 12, when, warned, when uh, being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they, the wise men, departed to their own country by another route. And that brings us to verse 13. When they had departed, the wise men departed. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. This is Joseph's second encounter with an angel in a dream. In chapter 1, you might remember he was told that, that Mary would be having a baby. The wise man's decision to not report to Herod uh, apparently bought some extra time, but Joseph and Mary still must flee with the baby to Egypt. There they would be outside of Herod's jurisdiction and safe from his efforts to eliminate what he deemed a potential rival. Verse 14, and he, Joseph, rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. Uh, Matthew apparently means they left 
that night. <laughs> they take the threat very seriously. It's about a, a 90 mile journey to the Egyptian border, so the trip would likely take a, a week or so. Then Joseph, Mary, and the baby, Jesus, lived in exile in Egypt until Herod died. How long was that? I don't know. You don't either. I, I, I Google this, and some Bible scholars say they were in Egypt for three or four months. Others say they were there for three or four years. Uh, the timeline in my ESV study Bible says Jesus is born in 5 B.C. and returns from Egypt when Herod dies in 4 B.C. Oh, wait a minute, Pastor Dan. Wasn't Jesus born in the year zero with B.C.? denoting years before Christ was born, and A.D., Anno Domini, the, the year of our Lord, counting the years after his birth? Well, yeah, that, that makes sense, but, but for decades, most scholars have said Herod died in 4 B.C., which meant Jesus had to be born before that. However, in recent years, some scholars have made the case, I think a good case, that Herod actually died in 1 AD, which kind of brings us back to zero for the year of Jesus' birth. The, the reality is whenever we are dealing with the ancient calendar, we're, we're dealing with a bit of speculation, at least to some degree. And there's nothing wrong with speculating, but, but don't put a lot of weight or emphasis on, on any teaching built on speculation. Focus instead on the truth that God clearly reveals in his word. If Matthew or the Lord wants us to know, wanted us to know how old Jesus was when he left Egypt, he could have easily told us that. Keep your focus on what God has said, not on what we wish he might have told us. You might check out Deuteronomy 29. Some of you have already memorized that verse. The secret things belong to the Lord God, but the things revealed belong to us. Anyway, Matthew 2, verse 15, Matthew then adds this, this time of exile, was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. Now, in this passage and throughout his entire gospel, Matthew loves to highlight messianic prophecies from the Old Testament that are fulfilled in Jesus. Uh, pretty amazing that 700 years before Jesus was born, uh, Isaiah would write about a virgin conceiving and having a son called Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, we saw that in, in chapter 1. Now, Matthew points to Hosea 2.15 and indicates that it is a prophecy, again, 700 plus years earlier, a prophecy that the Messiah would come from Egypt. Amazing. But when we go back to Hosea chapter 2, it doesn't seem to be talking about the Messiah at all, but about how the Lord had been faithful to his people, to Israel, by bringing them out of slavery in Egypt. So where did Matthew get the idea that this verse is about Jesus? I'll answer that question in a moment. I, I, I would say that when any New Testament writer quotes a passage from the Old Testament, he often seems to go beyond the, the plain message, the plain meaning of the text. Sometimes I think the New Testament writers grasp a fuller meaning, highlighting dimensions of the Old Testament prophecy that we may be missing. Other times, the Old Testament prophet may not have realized the significance of his words, but the God who inspired the prophet knew exactly what those words would mean in the future. Excuse me, I'm going to blow that nose again. 
The, the most important thing, however, is it's not a good idea to cry during the worship singing time. <laughs> the most important thing, however, is the storyline of the Bible, which at its heart is the salvation God provides through Jesus. And many things in the Old Testament are, are pointing us to Jesus, including the people of Israel themselves. God's relationship with them reflects the relationship of the eternal Father to the eternal Son. So Matthew did not think it strange that Hosea, when referring to the Exodus, is not only speaking of Israel, but he's also speaking of Messiah, of God's Son. Where did Matthew learn to interpret the Old Testament like that? <laughs> From Jesus. <laughs> From Jesus. It, it, it was not, I don't think it was just on Emmaus Road that Jesus, Luke 24, 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I don't think it's that much speculation to imagine that one night around the campfire, Jesus, and his Jesus told his disciples how Mary and Joseph had taken him to Egypt when he was a baby to protect him from, from Herod, and how this was a prophecy, in a sense, by Hosea. And Matthew was diligently taking notes as Jesus spoke, so that when he writes... 15 or 20 years later, he recalls both the story and the words of Hosea. Yes, speculation, but plausible. Well, Jesus is in Egypt, something very horrible happens in Judah. Verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old and under, according to the time he had ascertained from the wise men. Among the many evil acts of history, this one seems especially heinous. Now, the village of Bethlehem and surrounding area probably had 10 to 20 little boys in this group. But for each of those families, it was a horror that they would never forget. Herod's designation of two years and under doesn't mean Jesus was two years old when the wise men arrived. Herod may include more babies just to make sure that this baby king does not survive. This time, Matthew turns to the book of Jeremiah for a prophecy foreshadowing this atrocity. Verses 17 and 18. This was fulfilled, what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and, and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. That's from Jeremiah 31, verse 15. The prophet uses Rachel, the wife of Jacob, to symbolize the grief as Israel was taken into captivity and the nation was no more. In the same way, Herod is attempting to wipe out the one whom God has chosen to kill Jesus Messiah. But he failed. He failed. Jesus is safely in Egypt when Herod conducts his cruel slaughter. So, verses 19 and 21, when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph. He's getting used to angels showing up in his dreams, probably. Saying, rise, take the child and mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went back to the land of Israel. The time of exile, however long it was, is over. Verse 22. 
But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, Joseph was, and being warned in a dream, another dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. When Herod, again, he was called Herod the Great, not because of his great character, but his power. When Herod dies, the Romans divide up what had been considered his kingdom and appointed his three sons, Archelaus, Philip, and Antipas, as rulers over the different regions. So what was Herod's kingdom is now three districts. Apparently, Joseph intends to return to Bethlehem in Judea and raise, and raise Jesus there where his ancestral roots were, rather than in the hometown of Nazareth where, I suppose, circumstances surrounding Mary's pregnancy were still leaving kind of a shadow of a scandal. However, Archelaus would be ruling that territory. And he had a reputation, apparently deserved, of being even more cruel and impulsive than his father. After a few years, Caesar Augustus deposes Archelaus and sends him into exile because he fears the Jews are going to revolt because they can't stand this ruler. And dream number four confirms Joseph's fear, and so he heads north back to the district of Galilee and the city of Nazareth where he and Mary had been living before Jesus was born. The ruler of this region in northern Israel is not Archelaus, but Antipas, Herod Antipas. And as we read the gospel accounts, he doesn't exactly seem like a man of great character, but one of his virtues appears to be that he's not his brother anyway. So, verse 23, he, Joseph, went and lived in a city called Nazareth. Now, I think cities, uh, city is a bit of a mis misnomer. During uh, today, the population of Nazareth is about 77,000 people, but during the time of Jesus, it was probably between 500 and 1,000 people are, is the estimate. Incidentally, that confirms my analogy that, that Nazareth is kind of like Cook. Okay, it's this little town up north, but it's not as remote as places like Gein or Greeny. Okay, <laughs> Cook, Cook is a, a town, Nazareth is a town. A and this will be the home of Jesus for the vast majority of his life. Again, until he becomes an itinerant rabbi during what we call his three years of public ministry, he will live in this town called Nazareth. Continuing verse 23, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he, that Jesus, would be called a Nazarene. Now, there is no specific Old Testament prophecy indicating that the Messiah will come from Nazareth. Some assume this has something to do with a Nazarite vow, but that doesn't really have anything to do with Nazareth either. It seems that Matthew is saying, just as the prophets predicted the Messiah would be despised, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, just as the prophets predicted the Messiah would be despised, Jesus is despised simply because of his hometown. Remember Nathaniel's words when he first hears about Jesus? John 1, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Just like people, they say, can anything good come from Cook? No, they don't say that. <laughs> can, can anything good come from Nazareth? Being called a Nazarene was not a compliment in first century Israel. So from Bethlehem to Egypt to Nazareth. This is the path Joseph and Mary tra travel with the baby Jesus in this early part of his life. As guided by <laughs> four angelic dreams, they escape the wrath of the cruel Herod. 
It's an interesting story. It's a true story. And one with some important lessons for us. As with every portion of his word, God has something to say to each one of us through this passage. Highlight two of them. Number one, the Lord watches over and directs our lives in the ways he chooses. The Lord watches over and directs our lives in the ways he chooses. This is all about, this passage is all about God protecting the baby Jesus from Herod and Archelaus. Matthew points out three times how the Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled during this scenario. In the bigger picture, the Lord is protecting the seed of the woman from the seed of the serpent, Genesis 3.15. It was not God's plan that Jesus would die at the hand of Herod. It is God's plan that Jesus will die at the hands of the Romans in, in 33 AD. But it's not his plan that he's going to die at the hand of Herod. He would die in 33 AD because then, through his death and resurrection, he, the seed of the woman, will crush the head of the seed of the serpent, Satan himself. So in our text, God is working to thwart Herod's plans to kill the Messiah prematurely. There's a parallel here with our study of Esther this fall. Because there the Lord thwarts the plans of Haman, who, who wants to destroy the Jewish people, which would have prevented the Messiah from ever coming into the world. If Haman would have succeeded, there would be no Joseph, there would be no Mary, there would be no Jesus. God, however, used Esther and Mordecai to make sure that did not ha happen. Haman did not succeed. And all through the Old Testament, God is working to ensure that his redemptive plan through Jesus would be accomplished. God is protecting the Messiah, Jesus. However, I want you to note how God protects the baby Jesus from Herod. The angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream and tells him, flee, run to Egypt, run away. Now, th think for a moment. The angel of the Lord could have stood outside where the baby was, and, and could have protected him from Herod's soldiers. Or, or the angel of the Lord could have struck Herod dead in his sleep. The angel of the Lord could have done dozens of things that would have protected Jesus from Herod, most of which would have been easier for Joseph, Mary, and the baby than this 90-plus mile journey by foot to a land where they knew no one. But for his reasons, the Lord does not choose the easiest path for Joseph and his family. Having Herod plunge to his death accidentally falling from a balcony would have been so much easier. Yet for reasons we and likely Joseph did not understand, it was best for that family to spend time in exile in Egypt. Folks, some of you here may feel like right now you are in exile in Egypt. Health issues, financial problems, family conflict, the, the, the death of, of a loved one, bouts with anxiety and depression, or, or some other difficult thing has you asking, Lord, why, why? Why are you letting this happen to me? It, it would be so much better if you just made this problem disappear. The Lord would respond, <laughs> 
No, no, it, it would be easier for you if I just made the problem disappear, but it would not be better. What's easier is often not better. Remember, friend, if, if, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, God promises, Romans 8, 28, to somehow use every difficult experience in your life for his glory and for your ultimate good. Every difficult experience in your life will be used ultimately for his glory and your good. I'm not sure if Joseph and Mary or Jesus ever looked back and said, boy, I'm sure thankful for that time we spent in Egypt. But I believe God did use it to bring something good <laughs> to at least one of their lives. He used it for good. I don't know how God might use your, your health issues, your, your family conflicts, your financial problems, your, your, your bouts with anxiety and depression, your grief. I, I don't know he, how he might use that to accomplish something good in your life. But I believe he will. He will use it to accomplish something good. And, and yes, if he chooses to deliver, deliver you from uh, any of these things in an immediate, maybe miraculous way, that's wonderful. Praise God. If he chooses you to deliver you instantaneously. But if he doesn't, if he lets you languish in Egypt for a while, there's a reason. And if you're kind of stuck in Egypt, I would suggest you work on things like cultivating patience and, and, and perseverance. Do your best to avoid the traps of grumbling and complaining. Take time to feed on God's promises and allow them to fill you with hope because you won't be in Egypt forever. You won't be in Egypt forever. And then daily, you might pray something like this. Okay, Lord, I, I, I don't really like where I am at today. I, I wish things were different, but please show me what I should be doing today to honor you and serve others. Lord, what, what do you want from me right now? And please give me the grace to do it. <laughs> Friend, there is nothing wrong with praying that God will change your circumstances. But if he doesn't do that today, then you need to pray he will change your attitude. Pray he will change your attitude. Remember, the Lord works in our lives in all sorts of different ways. Number two. The second lesson I, I find in this text is that there are no little people and no little places. I borrow that from a book titled by Francis Schaeffer. No little people no little places. Nathaniel asks, can anything good come from Nazareth? The answer, oh, you bet it can. <laughs> you bet in fact. In fact, the, the best thing comes from Nazareth because that's where Jesus Messiah comes from. A few years ago, I was messaging on Facebook with my uh, a friend Jane She's a friend from college. I hadn't talked to her in many years. And I said, well, Jane, what, what have you been up to? And she replied, well, my husband and I have been serving with IFES, a, a wonderful ministry. And we spent eight years at Oxford, England. And then the last seven years, we were in New Zealand. And I thought, wow, what a cool ministry. Talk in my mind, talk about exotic places to serve the Lord. Uh, Oxford, where C.S. Lewis was, and, and then in New Zealand. 
And, and, and then she writes, what about you, Dan? What, what have you been doing? <laughs> well, I was at Cambridge for a few years, and no. I responded, well, for the pe- this is a few years ago. I said, well, for the past 25 years, I've been pastoring a church in northern Minnesota. She writes, northern Minnesota, exclamation mark, question mark, exclamation mark, question mark. And then she says, well, I guess people need Jesus there too. (laughs) And I replied, they sure do. They sure do. I know there's some metro people here today, but do do you ever find that people make fun of you for living on the Iron Range? Or, Or northern Minnesota? Or do you ever feel the job that you have is just not very significant? Or, or, or maybe you look at the house in which you live and it seems so old and, and ordinary. Or you look in the mirror and you think, wow, well, talk about old and ordinary. <laughs> Or, or you think about other families around you and all the fun things they're doing, all the things they're posting on Facebook about the fun things they're doing, and, and your family and your life seems so boring. Friend, always remember there are no little people and there are no little places God has a purpose and a plan for you, and there is nothing in the world more important than you doing what God has called you to do today. Nothing is more important than that. No matter who you are, no how old you are, whatever. If you are doing what God has called you to do today, nothing is more important than that. Because if you do what the Lord has called you to do today, you have accomplished as much as anyone else on the planet. Oh, you may be from Nazareth, my friend. You might even be from Cook. But if you are bringing honor to the Lord today, if you are serving those around you today, you have done something very, very good and you've done something really important. Really important. May the Lord give us the grace to do that. Honor him, serve others. May he give us the grace to do that today and throughout the year of our Lord, 2023.